Welcome to the Layman Seminary. Um, I'm continuing my debate preparation for my debate with Dan Chapa that's in a, in a few days on February 25th at 8 p.m. Central. Um, so in my last video, I was going through, let's see if I can find it real quick. You know, I was walking through the evaluation of the different videos, um, and we started discussing this particular video right here about how to understand the participle and uh, the conditional stuff. And I and I mentioned about this thing, this uh, webinar that I pr participated in with Todd Skaywater of Exegetical Tools, who's a reform guy, um, had the same Greek professor that I took at Southwestern, which is the reason that I took the guy. Um, uh, Dr. Hutchison. And uh, so anyway, uh, in it, I'm in this webinar and we're translating the very passage that we're talking about before I ever got in seminary. I mentioned this video here, the sound's not that good at the very beginning, so you can keep it on silent, but it, it, it gets clear towards the, uh, you know, at, shortly after it begins at some point. And so you can see me working on that passage there. I've mentioned about nerdy language majors, the challenge that was put out about this passage. Uh, I mentioned this guy, John A. Sproley or Spro. Um, this is his structure, how he diagrammed the passage. We talked about that last time. Um, I was originally going to read the Spro article, but instead I'm going to tell you how do you get a hold of it yourself. Um, and uh, uh, I was originally going to continue playing this video right now, uh, but I'm going to come back later on whenever I'm getting to the part about the ground and the curse and stuff to play it. And the, re and the reason I'm going to wait off on that is because, you know, like I said, I have this article um, by Sproul that, that uh, Todd Skaywater and Exegetical Tools mentioned. And uh, um, you can go... You can go. You can go to Galaxy and get it there. You know, with a subscription, like I said, five dollars a month, or fifty dollars a year, or something like that. Or you can get it in Logos. Uh, it's actually in the Grace Theological Journal, Volume Two. And what's interesting is whenever I searched John Sproul's name, it came. His name came up in this Hebrews uh, Exegetical Guide to Greek New Testament uh, commentary from 2019 this is very greek intensive or syntax and things like that um and so has a discussion here about how it could be translated makes a statement about how the net takes uh the word peripipto to mean even commit apostasy and it gives a bedag number for that but it talks about the the crux interpretive uh for debates concerning sociology is about how to take the participle it says, uh, as a long tradition, taking the participle as a verbial with a conditional force, and if they fall away, or even less consistent as even though. But it says the participle is the fifth and final in the series of aorist participles. If this participle is constructed as a verbial, then it's unclear why the preceding three participles should not also be thus construed. That the article in verse four governs only the first participle uh, should not also uh, be thus construed. So they're saying that it, it's got to be governing them all, basically. The bracketing participle was between the predicate and verse four and its complement six strongly suggests participles be the participles be treated as a group. All right. So that seems to be confirming uh, what I learned, uh, first of all, through exegetical tools. I've come across this in several places across several traditions now. But um. So in the midst of this, it's talking about that they're all global or constative heiresses. Uh, then it mentions John Sproley, okay, and his article. Thus, the participle indicates the progression to follow the first four participles and then have fallen away, as the ESV has it. Um, the force of the author's argument is amplified by the increasing length of the first four participles, which sharply contrast with the unmodified fifth. And so then it says, see further studies, the warning passes in Hebrews. So you click on that within there and it starts giving you resources. Some of these already got uh, exegetical papers, uh, anything pertinent about that, which is nice. So I, I just clicked on the first one, Compton Bruce, and I got an idea of his view. Um, 
actually, uh, so then it got right here for further apostasy in Hebrews. You can click on that as well and uh, get more information about that. There's several of those in there, but this is the Compton article, 1996. Okay. And so he's uh, taking a view different than mine. Uh, and I will have to evaluate that in more detail. But to get a good window, both in the preparation and for y'all, I want to show you what I stumbled upon that uh, um, that I think is going to help my debate preparation and be a blessing to y'all as well. So this is wordexplained.com. Never heard of this before. Don't know anything about the person. But it was when I was searching for that name, John Sproley, that I found this. And so you can look here and it says, who are the people described in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6? Notice it's got all the questions in each one of this hyperlink, the background of Hebrews. What is the elementary tension? What is the foundation arising here? I'm going to make this bigger so we can see it better. Um, what is the foundation of writer wishes not again to lay? Who are the people described? What is impossible to do? What is significant to agriculture illustrations? What is the writer convinced about his readers? What is the word desire? desire for his readers? What hope do we have in conclusion? So he's got all this laid out. And my guess, he has probably the whole Bible like this because you see New Testament outlines, Old Testament outlines. So this is definitely a website that I'm going to be looking into because he's kind of doing some of the stuff that I've already done or that I'm in the process of doing for this debate. So look at here. Um, let's start right here. Identifying who the author is talking about in Hebrews 6 is a pursuit fraught with disagreement, okay? And let's just draw some stuff on here while we're going. I'm going to move this. So notice he quotes Constable's Notes. And then he tells us that Constable's Notes gives an excellent summary of the different views of the passage. Okay, so we want to we want to examine that. You know, so this is telling us Constable's Notes has a good summary of the different views of the passage. I include here his summary along with his footnotes. So this guy is already condensing the most important stuff from Constable's Notes. So he's including the summary along with his footnotes, which is what I've been doing when I've been making my debate paper. So this is great. Following his quotation, I document his examples under the appropriate footnotes he provides along with an introductory tag in the brackets for each note, okay? The writer pointed out the consequences of not pressing on the maturity to motivate his readers to pursue spiritual growth diligently. I agree that um, this is about maturity and it's about growth. Christians have interpreted this passage in many different ways. Some believe that those who fall away are believers who lose their salvation. So it's got footnote 310 there. Others hold that those who fall away are people who have professed to be believers, but are really not. That's the typical um, Calvinistic approach. Not only Calvinistic, but um, that's the typical approach they take. One writer who has held that view claimed that they are, they're all well-instructed unbelievers. Okay, Still, others take the whole situation as hypothetical. They believe that if a Christian could lose his salvation, which he cannot, it would be impossible for them to be saved again. A fourth view is that only Hebrew Christians living before the destruction of AD 70 could commit this sin, whatever it is. And that, that is a possibility. I'm not going to rule that one out. The view that I believe harmonizes best with the writer's emphasis is those who fall away are believers who turn away from God's truth and embrace error. And so he calls them apostates. The majority of scholars view these people as genuine believers. Okay. And then... Um, Dr. Constable's explanatory footnotes are as follows. So this is where he's given. Occasionally, okay, had a brief comment in brackets introduced by the initials, as in JTB. The link provided in the footnotes direct the reader back to the footnotes of Constable's commentary. When he has referred to certain writers prior to these footnotes, he does not cite the book title, but only the author. The reader of the article wishes to identify the particular book title. Now, listen here, have to search backward to Constable's lengthy notes. Okay, so 310. Let's change our colors so we can see what's going on here. 310. So this is this one right here. Believers who lose their salvation. That's the view. So Westcott, Moffitt, Linsky, and Howard Marshall have that 
uh, as demonstrated by kept by the power of God. Okay. 311, this one is professing but not genuine believers. Henry, Bruce, Philip Hughes, Pink, uh, Safer, Gablin, Eshuler English, Kent, R. Kent Hughes, Stedman, New Scofu Reference, um, JTB. I can't remember what JTB is. Uh, I would add here John MacArthur. Okay. So this guy is adding there in there. So you can see that this is very helpful that you can make a chart really easy from this information. And that's probably what I'm going to do. All right. 312 now. This one. Well-instructed unbelievers, that's Pink's view. And then you have the hypothetical view in 313. Okay. And let me just clear this so we can move this down. The hypothetical view, you have all the people here, Westcott, Guthrie, and so on. So yeah, this is definitely going to, in the Ryrie Study Bible, I've been looking for this for years. I can't. I couldn't remember where he made this comment at, but now I remember. So that's good. Then you got the time sensitive view. I guess it's the seventy AD view. A fourth through is the only Hebrew Christian living before the destruction temple could have committed this sin, whatever it is. And it's got to click on there for you to watch it or or, or view it. Uh, Three fourteen Christians to apostatize. So you got Swindoll. You got a couple of others. A constable self holds to this view. It says, Hans, uh, Constable holds this view that I believe harmonized best with the writer's emphasis is those who fall away are believers who turn away from God's truth and embrace error. However, he does not believe these apostate Christians lose their salvation, but they're unable to repent, presumably unable to return to fellowship. Okay. Then he mentions saying Hodges writes a warning is given danger, move from position of true faith and life to the extent to become a disqualified for the service and inherit to millennial glory. Okay. Uh, I can definitely see that idea. 315, the majority of scholars view these people as genuine believers. Marshall, um, even though Marshall says that he doesn't believe they're genuine, I think, or he, I mean, he does. He thinks you can lose their salvation, if I remember right. All right, so that, that will make for a good chart. Now let's go forward. Let us now examine the group of people identified by the author phrase by phrase. We will then seek to explain what each phrase means. Let it be said, first of all, that all six of these characteristics will identify the same group of people. What is true is identifying characteristic one, for example, is true of those identified in two, three, four, five, and six. It is not advisable, for example, to separate category six as a conditional clause. So this is where he's going into talking about the participle. Don't separate the last one as conditional clause because all the others are not conditional. Uh, all six of these characteristics describe the same group of people. John A. Sproley, this is out the connection, or Sproul, maintains that all of the five participles are adjective substantive participles. The last participle cannot be taken as an adverbial participle, function as a protestant of a conditional statement. Moreover, each of the five participles below, item five, does not have its own participle. Okay, the reader must supply the participle from item four. Okay, that's interesting. Keep that in mind. It is an error. This means that the action described took place at some point in the past. In addition, the author speaks of the people contemplated, and he was in the third person. Those who, one could argue, and some do, that he's disassociated himself with the people contemplated. Obviously, this is true because he himself has never, along with his readers, he presumes taken the final step of falling away. Item six. But that is no evidence in itself that Christians cannot participate in the sixth characteristic of falling away. Okay. There's some other thoughts that are coming to my mind in light of what I read there, but I don't think it's a problem for right now. I think we're just going to keep rolling as we're going. Um. Those having once been enlightened, Hebrews 6, 4. The writer in Hebrews 6, 1, 3 has used first person plural we and us pronouns. Let us pray, press on the maturity. This we will do. In, he, in 6, 4 through 6, he abruptly changes his manner of speaking. He speaks literally of the ones who haven't been enlightened 
and the people thus envisioned literally are again crucifying to themselves, third person pronoun, the Son of God. In so doing, the writer seems to disassociate himself and his readers from the people in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. This is a consistent, this is consistent with his exhortation and belief in Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, that he and his readers will press on to maturity. It is also consistent with the statement in Hebrews 6, 9. But beloved, we're convinced of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation, that we're speaking this way. And this is not positional salvation, in my view. Okay. These facts are not necessary to be construed, however, as proof that people whom the writer describes in Hebrews 6 are not Christians. Okay. To the contrary, the vocabulary seems to indicate that they are. He takes a stance that these readers are not among the that kind of Christians. Nevertheless, the reader must be warned. That's why he writes as he does. Okay, so that's a good point. So you got you got the um you got the 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 leaders, right? Whoever's writing the letter, right? So we will call those the faithful. All right. The faithful. They're they're identifying with Jesus Christ, who is the faithful one. And then you have the unfaithful. And so the faithful is exhorting the unfaithful to be faithful, right? Um, so rather than this saying the saved, this is not positional salvation here. And this uh, being unsaved here. No, it, it's just distinguishing the two classes. And, and this is all throughout the Old Testament and covenant and sanctification categories. So I like this distinction here. Um, okay. Having been enlightened. Man, this is good. This is going to speed up my preparation a whole lot. And, and theirs as well, because I can watch this video. Having been enlightened in the air is plural past the participle of Fotizo. It appears but 11 times in the New Testament, two of them here in Hebrews. Both times it appears in a passive voice, which means some forced person outside the individual contemplated performing the enlightening. Dallas, it's God that's enlightening. All right. Dallas, not Dallas. <laughs> I believe that the writer stated those about whom he's writing have been enlightened with the gospel of Christ and have responded firmly to the enlightenment. Zane Hodges agrees. He said this is the natural way to refer to the conversion experience. The writers are uh, only other use of the verb enlighten in Hebrews 10 32, where the reference to true Christian experience can be hardly doubted. Okay. Elsewhere, Jesus used the present subjunctive form of the verb in 11 36, comparing someone with healthy perceptive spiritual vision to one who might be illumined with the rays of a lamp. Uh, and John. John 1 9 spoke of Jesus as a true light who by his coming in the world illuminates every man. JTB. Maybe this is his comment, paraphrase. That illumination, it might be pointed out, make every man responsible, but does not save every man. Okay. In 4 5, it seems to speak of a time of coming judgment when the Lord comes and will both bring to light things hidden in darkness. So coming judgment, the closed motives of men's heart. In Ephesians 18, Paul prays the eyes of the Ephesians' heart might be enlightened. So that they would know certain spiritual truths. And Ephesians 3, Paul states that one of the responsibilities to bring to light what is the ministration of the ministry. And that's about the church. In 2 Timothy, Paul spoke of the appearing of Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The three occurrences of Revelation seem to refer to physical light. And the city of New Jerusalem, by the glory of God and the light. Okay, the two occurrences, Hebrew and uh uh, let's see here. Yeah, the same writer use the same word in the same way. Yeah. So, I mean, these other statements are helpful, but I think it's significant that the same author uses it in the same context. All right. It is difficult to make the case from the passage outside of Hebrews that being enlightened always means one has been saved. In John 1 9, for example, so. He's saying it, it by itself. And see, that's the whole thing. Is there, this participle is not by itself. The statement about tasted is probably going to shift this into the concept of belief. Um, let's see. And many other passages are not discussed salvation at all, right? 
but the two Hebrew passages where it seems they use the word the same way, and in both cases, more like he's using the term having been lightened to refer to an appropriate response to the mess of salvation rather than he's not. However, it's difficult to be dogmatic. Yet the writer of both warning paths certainly takes the position that the readers are generally saved people and, and, and that they will heed the warnings. This view is supported by the fact that in Hebrews 1 6, I mean 6 1 through 3, the writer used the first person world, uh, we in the discussion, while in the warning paths, it changed to the third person, those with them. Okay. All right, so moving on. Those who have tasted of the heavenly gifts. So we're to the second participle now. Have tasted the translation of Eris participle guomai, literally haven't tasted. John McCarthy argues the people in vision tasted or sampled the heavenly gift, but did not truly partake of it. I think he's absolutely wrong there. Um, so this is what he says. The great gift, however, was not received. It was not feasted on, but only tasted, sampled, was not accepted or lived. Only examined the stands of contrast, Jesus work on our behalf, having tasted death for every man, he went on to drink as well. Okay, so this is what's so ironic. He brings up this passage and he claims that there's a contrast there. But how do you know that there's a contrast there? Because you've already made assumptions about the text. It could be actually saying the same thing. The difficulty scripture example gives Hebrews 2 9 does not support his conclusion. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And he was too nine. Jesus tasting death was not just a sampling. It was full blown participation. Jesus didn't merely sample death. He partook of it fully. Why would the biblical author employ a different meaning for tasting Hebrews 6 than he did in 2 9? It makes more sense to provide greater consistency if we argue that the writers used Gulmai in Hebrews 6 4 is the same as he used in Hebrews 2 9. Jesus fully partook of death, and the people under consideration in Hebrews 6 4. Fully partook of the heavenly gift. See the author word study on Gulamai. So this guy's done word studies and everything else. This is impressive. What was the heavenly gift which your people described in 6-4 tasted? No one knows for certain, of course. We're going to make an educated guess. MacArthur's opinion is good as any. The greatest heavenly gift, of course, Christ himself and the salvation he brought. All right. We conclude then that when the writer described people as having tasted the heavenly gift, he meant that they had fully received the gift of Christ and his salvation, and they were Christians. Okay, having been made partakers of the Holy Ghost. What does it mean to have been made a partaker, metakos, of the Holy Spirit? Does the terminology of the people in question were generally believers in Jesus and thus partakers of the Holy Spirit, or does the terminology fall short of salvation? Were they possessors of the Holy Spirit or were they merely onlookers who witnessed his power and appeared to be saved, but were really only masquerading as Christians? Proponents of the view that people in vision were not believers point out that the phrase in question, partakers of the Spirit, is a typical when compared to other designations about Christians having the Spirit. For example, Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit living in Okeo, um, a, a believer uh, in Okeo. He speaks of believers having been sealed Spagarazzo uh, with the Holy Spirit, and he speaks of Christians having been baptized, baptizo, but one spirit in the body. He speaks of the Holy Spirit as having been given as a pledge, our bone of our inheritance. So the argument goes that since the writer of the Hebrews failed to use any of these Pauline designations, it's not Paul writing, so it's not a problem. He cannot admit that the people in question in Hebrews 6 were believers, but that it seems to me is an argument from silence. It proves nothing with regard to the book of Hebrews except perhaps that Paul did not write the letter. It would be far more instructive, it seems to me, to look at how the word partaker is used in the New Testament. So he's saying word study. Okay. In the New Testament, partaker, metakos, is used but six times. Five of those times in the book of Hebrews. Wow. Why would he not want to find out how the writer of Hebrews did uh, use this word rather than obsess over how Paul did not use the designation on the spirit? Let us examine each of the uses of metakos. In Luke 5, 7, it means partners, fellow fishermen in another boat. Or, or one is either a partner in commercial venture or not. In Hebrews 1, 9, the Messianic king will experience even greater joy than his companions, his supporters. These are individuals who will partake of the king's reign here upon earth. No argument can be made that these companions are not genuine believers in the king, shares with him in his mission and value. In Hebrews 3.11, the writer of Hebrews addresses the readers as holy brothers, sharers, or partakers of a heavenly calling. 
There's no indication that these sharers were not really Christians. The description Holy Brothers demands that they were. In Hebrew 3, and, and I could deal with the phenomenological language stuff later on. Um, it's usually a cop-out. Um, and eventually we have to do it. We may have to do a specific debate of that in the future. In Hebrews 3.14, the writer addresses readers as partakers of Christ. That partaking of Christ is conditioned upon their holding fast, the beginning of our assurance firm to the end. Once again, there's no evidence that the writer envisions of someone who's not really a Christian. Okay. There's um, Hebrews 6.4, based upon the evidence we have a partaker of the Holy Spirit is someone who is a believer who generally partakes of the ministry of the Spirit. In Hebrews, the writer asserts that all believers have become partakers of discipline. There's no indication that this is shallow, non-genuine participation of discipline. Okay, good. To sum up the matter, most likely meaning a metacos in Hebrews 6.4 is that the people of vision were genuine believers of the Holy Spirit, partakers of the Holy Spirit. They were fully believers in Christ and as such fully partake or possess the Holy Spirit. Every use of the adjective New Testament suggests a genuine and full participant partaker in other person's activity or ministry, whether on a human level, the fishermen, fatherly discipline or our human divine level partaking of Christ of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So once again, the tasting comes up. Um, and have a taste of the good work of God. Once again, the word tasted is the plural. Good. I have tasted at a point in time. MacArthur opines that the people addressed here sampled the word, but was not eaten. But the same objection can be raised. How could the tasting of the good word Rhema of God in 6.5 and the tasting of the heavenly gift of salvation in 6.4 be qualities really different than Jesus tasting the death for everyone. If Jesus did not merely sample death but actually took part in it, why should not the people addressed in 6.4 have actually partaken of salvation in Hebrews 6.4 and have actually partaken of the good word? See and examine the use of Gulamai. And by the way, Dan Chapa agrees that tasted refers to believers, at least from the recent video that I've seen. It makes the most sense when examined the writers use the word Gumai to conclude that the people in question were actually Christians. They had read the word of God, listened to it, examined it, and benefited of it. They previously concluded according to scripture, Jesus and Nazareth is actually the Messiah, the anointed one of Israel. Okay. Now, one thing that discerner um, and said in the comment is like, who's really experienced the uh, our the powers of the coming age well i think what may what is the maybe the argument of the idea is is that the powers related to the spiritual gifts uh this is the idea of the foretaste or maybe a beta version that is similar going on and what's going on in the church age for the new covenant but um it's it's a taste of what's to come in the messianic kingdom because the, the new covenant that will be installed at that time is it not exactly how things are right now? Um, not saying I believe in two new covenants. I'm just talking about different aspects flowing from that one covenant, or this idea that there's a a, a beta or a sample version. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Those haven't tasted the powers of the coming age six five. And having tasted the powers of the age to come, the word having tasted or better tasted does not appear in the original text. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, but they are understood to be there because the participle verb form preceding clause, guamai, is linked to this verb with possessive and, te. Okay, that makes sense. The word powers, dunamis, appears here in the plural. Of the 119 uses in the Greek New Testament, it appears in the plural 26 times. Of these 26 times, three refer to powers of heaven being shaken in connection with or immediately following the tribulation. Okay. And two seem to refer to supernatural powers like angels, whether good or evil. The other all include miracles being done. Of the remainder of four occasions, powers is linked with other miraculous words such as signs and wonders. So look at Hebrews 2 4. So the people in question in Hebrews 6 had experienced miraculous powers. It does not mean that they had performed them, but they were beneficiaries of these powers. Just as stated in Hebrews 2, 4, the writer for a so great salvation, which is not positional, that was initially spoken through their Lord, then confirmed to us by the words we heard. God also testifying with them both the signs and wonders and by various miracles, by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. 
Now I mentioned this, the so great salvation, it's messianic millennial kingdom salvation. And you think about it in the book of Acts, he taught the kingdom for 40 days. And then the next thing to happen is on Pentecost, 10 days later, they receive the Holy Spirit with all these signs and stuff. So you can see that even with the teaching about the kingdom, which is related to so great salvation, there were signs and stuff that followed. Even though it was a, a, a redirection concerning the church age coming into existence, the metaphorical body of Christ. Okay. Let me clear this. All right. Having tasted these miraculous powers does not mean to serve as an indicator they're having merely sampled the powers without swallowing. The testing here is real and participating in Christ having tasted death for everyone. The writer's reference to the powers of age to come suggests that just as Jesus' first coming was marked by miracles, so his second coming will be marked by miracles also. The age of Christ's millennial kingdom will evidently be characterized by miracles. Yeah, that's what I just said. Those haven't fallen away. Now, when I translated this in the, the um, thing, I translated these all substantively, basically. So the fallen ones. is how I took it. All right. The tasters, the, uh, the enlightened ones, so on, the tasted ones or whatever. So by doing that, if I remember right, I think it's an heiress. Um, yeah, it's an heiress. And so by when I see having fallen away, it makes me almost think of the perfect. But if it's the heiress, then I'm just describing the disease as a category. Um, and then that's not a reference necessarily to the idea that they have fallen, but I think there's other arguments for that. I'm still undecided about that. All right, so Hebrews said then have fallen away. So this is the resulted thing. I think they're taking Kai as result there, uh, fallen away. Better and haven't fallen away. The writer has already listed five characteristic people in consideration, Hebrews 6. Now he adds a six. They have fallen away. Eris participle peripipto, used only here in the New Testament. So it's a hot pox. Far from being a hypothetical fallen away, this is one of the six characteristics that describes these people. I agree. It's not hypothetical. A good article to read on this regard is Sproul, right? That one. The author defends the view the participle must be understood as an adjective of substitute participle rather than an adverbial participle. As such, the participle cannot be taken as conditional and translated as Protestant conditional statement. Now, the other thing is, I think this guy is actually reformed, um, the one that wrote that article, based on something he said in his paper. Let me see if I can bring it up. He says in a footnote, the author is currently engaged in a preparation of a manuscript for publication entitled The Doctrine of Perseverance in Epistle of Hebrews. In this work, each of the warning passages in the epistle will be dealt with exhaustively and exegetically to demonstrate the type of individual being described in the warning passage is an unbeliever, the apostate view. So even though this guy <clears throat> has come to the conclusion about the participle being adjectival or substantival, he's basically saying is that he still holds the view that this is talking about unbelievers here. Okay. So it would be interesting to see how he came to that conclusion. Um, I've done a little bit of searching around. I haven't seen that commentary that's brought forth yet. I'll keep looking for that as time permits, but uh, we're in crunch time guys. There's not much more time to, to uh, prepare. Um, so the logic is therefore that in the thinking of the author of Hebrews, all six of these characteristics go together. It would not do to take the sixth side and the fifth participle as a conditional factor to be added on to what is assumed to be true about the five preceding characteristics. In other words, what is understood about one portion of the group under consideration is true of each of them. And if one characteristic is true about these people, all the other characteristics are true as well. Let us first examine the meaning of the word having fallen away. The word is there as participle. The opening two words in Greek in Hebrews 6, 6 should be translated literally and having fallen away. What did the author mean? It is impossible to gain a full understanding of peripipto from other New Testament uses, for this is the only appearance 
Its lexical meaning is literally fall beside or aside or go astray, become lost, figure to the New Testament, or abandon the former relationship, turn away, commit apostasy. Okay, so this is within the range of meaning. Freiburg Analytical Lexicon Greek New Testament. Okay. Nevertheless, the writer had already introduced this concept under different words. And in 2 1, he stated, For this reason, we must pay close attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Okay. Drift away. Pereruel, to float by, hence slip away, used only here. Observe that the writer included himself in the warning. Take care, brethren, that there not be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Fall away. Ephestimi. Observe that the writer was talking to believers, brethren. In Hebrews 4.11, he worried. Therefore, let us fear <clears throat> while a promise remaining in his rest. Any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Come short of it translates as hustereo. Uh, in Hebrews 4.11, he exhorts his readers, therefore, let us be diligent to enter the rest so that no one will fall uh, through following the same example of disobedience, pipto. Again, he includes himself in the warning. And so this is something probably, so it's using these synonyms to describe their condition and everything, but it's interesting to use the word fall here, pipto, because this is the verbal form of the participle form of the one that's in our passage. So this probably has the most weight. Again, he includes himself in the warning. So what did the uh, what did the writer have in mind here? First, I believe he was addressing Christians. Second, I believe he was addressing a largely Jewish audience. Under repeated pressures from their unbelieving fellow Jews, they were tempted to give up the Christian profession and return to their ancestor faith. Zane Hodges, Bible Knowledge Commentary. Comparing scripture with scripture, we know that this cannot mean that they're in danger of losing their salvation. The very concept of eternal life precludes that. Also does the clear statements of Jesus, St. Hodges writes. Naturally, the words fall away cannot refer to loss of eternal life, which the gospel of John makes perfectly clear. Now, the question is, does Jan Tampa in any type of way believe that salvation could be lost? I think he doesn't because he believes that these warning passages are the means by which one is preserved. I mean, that that's even can be argued as a reformed view. So I'm not sure, honestly. And I did ask that question underneath the video. Because whenever I finish a video, I comment on them. That way they know exactly where I'm at in my preparation. All right. Um... The writer evidently has in mind defection from the faith that is apostasy withdrawal from the Christian profession. Okay. So what was it the writer of Hebrews feared? He feared that some Christians would revert to Judaism. And this is what I want people to understand, guys. I don't want that popped up. All right. This is what I want people to understand. Because Judaism is no longer the model for sanctification, it's been temporarily set aside. So to use Judaism is the equivalent of using a desecrated temple, if you will. Okay, so let's just put this here, desecrated temple. It's all right. That has not been cleansed. Now, I believe in a, there's going to be a millennial temple and it's probably going to be built during the tribulation. But a desecration will occur first. If me being pre-trib, I believe that the Antichrist would desecrate. But even people that are not pre-trib believe that. So the thing is, is that in the model of sanctification the theocracy, the covenant, the constitution, the enabling that occurs during the time of, of, of underneath the Mosaic law, as it's explained. This is now, because it's no longer the means that God has chosen, this is the equivalent of a counterfeit, okay? Or a false system. See, and Chafer said this years ago, he said, the believer needs to know what doesn't apply to him as much as he does uh, to know what does apply to him. 
And he's talking about primary application, not secondary application. Because basically what he said is that if you try, if you think that you're underneath the law, you're going to be living to that standard. And if you think that you're living in the millennium, you're uh, uh, you're going to be living to that standard. You're going to try to. And you're going to constantly be frustrated because the, the standard of the rule of life for the church is not the same for those three time periods. Um, so the point is, is that I don't think Christians grasp that once God sets aside something and says, no, this is not how I'm operating. This is viewed as satanic. Okay. And since it's viewed as satanic, then to go back to it is to worship Satan. It's the equivalent of paganism. But the problem is, is that in America, I think mainly American Christians, we bought into a lie that basically says that uh, apostasy can cannot include being a Satanist, being an atheist, being a Muslim, being a Hindu, being a Buddhist after believing the gospel and becoming a, a Christian positionally. But the problem with that is it's all one same it's all one same system, the counterfeit kingdom. So Satan will use different flavors, whether it's Islam, whether it's Judaism of today, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Hinduism, whether it's atheism, whether it's agnosticism, it goes on and on. So when people think that a Christian cannot fall into Satanism or embrace any of these other revelations, they've bought into the lie that this model that God has rejected and temporarily set aside, you know, even though it was good for its time and it's for purposes and stuff, the thing is, is the selfish child wants it now. And sometimes a good thing that you want now can mean a sin. Like you're not supposed to get your presents on Christmas until Christmas. But if you want them now and you throw a fit and you rebel and you unwrap them, which I've done before, um, you ruin Christmas. You know, and you desecrate things and you sin, you sin against your parents. So you can want a good thing at the wrong time. And, and that's what Satan does. Satan will try to offer a good thing at the wrong time. And that's something to keep in consideration, because I really feel like that people do not realize that all of this points to Satan and his system, his counterfeit system. And Judaism is just one little snippet apart. So the word apostasy relates to any form of this. Okay. And yeah, we could talk about more apostasy and doctrines of Christianity, apostasy or whatever. We, we could go down that route. But I just want people to grasp this idea right here because I think it's very key. All right. So. So he feared that the Christians would revert to Judaism or in some way, their confession of faith. All right, so this is the thing to understand. He doesn't want them to revert to Judaism because 70 AD is approaching, which relates to temporal judgment, okay? And, th and then this temporal judgment means that they will not physically stay alive, right? Which means because they won't physically stay alive, they won't have opportunity, no opportunity to progress, which means that they lose out on future rewards that they could have earned. All right. But that's describing the condition in the church age for the Jew. All right. 70 AD, temporal judgment, perhaps uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is involved in this. And if so, the key is is that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that's mentioned in Matthew is a national temporal sin. In other words, it's not about positional salvation at all. 
Um, and, and so it could be related to the Israel being temporarily set aside and the judgment God pronounces on the nation, 70 AD. But because in, in the book, let's continue this thought. I'll go ahead and keep it pink. In the book, the promised land, okay, is the Messianic Millennial Kingdom. It's not heaven, all right? Now, the promised land <clears throat> refers to the possibility of receiving future rewards and rank and things like that. Now, before they get through the promised land, they will have to go through the tribulation. Okay, this is when Israel comes to salvation during the tribulation and so on, right? So there are similarities between uh, the second generation Hebrews and the second generation Israelites. But there's also similarities between the tribulation generation and those that will go into the Messianic millennial kingdom. I think the difference, though, with the tribulation generation is that Israel starts in unbelief, whereas the book of Hebrews, everyone is in belief. OK. Um, so I'm just thinking about this. And so like right now, the way I'm leaning and even I lean this way in my debate with a, uh, with a Daniel Mirror, my very first debate is that this is more of the idea. OK. And but the Bible uses the, the promised land. And the Messianic Millennial Kingdom rewards as an illustration about that. So I don't think the tribulation is in view here, but I think it could be. Um, I think that as I brought up in my Daniel Mirror view of things, uh, I need to play that. I need to play my opening for that. Um, so let me finish reading this and then I'll play that opening. Okay, let's see here. So then they would become disqualified for service. He feared that many of their works would be burned up so that they would suffer great loss. All right, so it would revert to Judaism, deny their confession. And so then they would become disqualified for service. I can understand the disqualified idea because it does use a dokimas in Hebrews 6. Um but I don't necessarily think it's referring to rewards there. I'm taking it more of a temporal judgment primary focus. And that's just my working hypothesis for now. He feared that many of their works would be burned up so that they would suffer great loss. See, this is reading 1 Corinthians 3 in there, and there are similarities to it. But I think this is actually pulling from Deuteronomy 30 language, and it's using metonymy. In other words, the uh, it's substituting... This idea, of, in other words, all these specifics refer to God's divine discipline. And divine discipline can include loss of rewards, and it can also talk about uh, temporal discipline or temporal judgment. And if you're there like the slave who declined to invest his mind, they would be deprived of serving the king, I agree with this part, in a meaningful way during his coming kingdom. Okay, I agree with that. A conclusion. The writer of Hebrews contemplates a group of people possessing six characteristics. He describes them as one, those haven't been enlightened. Two, those haven't been tasted the heavenly gift. Three, those haven't been partakers of the Holy Spirit. Four, those have, have tasted of the good word. Five, those haven't tasted the powers of the coming age. And, and six, those who have fallen away. The vocabulary examined in the context of the writer's own use of words seems decisively to indicate that people under consideration are believers. I'll be a believer's tempted to apostatize from their previous confession of faith in Jesus. The writer of Hebrews made it very clear from the beginning of his description of Hebrews 6 in the Greek text, not in ASB, that it is impossible for those believers, I'm talking about Adunaton, are described in all of these characteristics to do something. Literally wrote, for it is impossible. And then it gives a parenthetical, those who once been enlightened have taste, they have a gift, da 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 da, -da and all, all of that, right? And then, uh, um, and then he says, and have it fall away again to 
renew them to repentance. What does it mean to be impossible again to renew the parents? The next article seeks to answer that question. Well, we're definitely going to keep trucking uh, using this resource. There's no doubt about it. This is a great resource. This is streamlining exactly what I was doing. So I'm glad I was on the right track. This guy's organizational skills are well, way better than mine. And he's got a better format. So I, I'm really appreciative of this. Um, okay. So what I want to do next is I want to bring up the Daniel Mayer debate. And I think I can do this. Because I'm not live right now, guys. I'm uh, uh I'm not live right now. I'm uh um I'll go to SFT's channel, even though it's on mine now. Standing for true. I uh I'm doing a premiere, and because what that allows me to do is while the premiere is playing, I will be able to work on uh my next uh video or my next presentation i can continue researching while this is playing that's essentially what i'm saying which of these find it oh, okay sorry i was reading um i was reading a advertisement there what do you call it uh a poll all right so i keep bringing people back to this debate because i tried to do this debate professionally you know, in the sense that I, I gave an academic presentation, I gave respect to, to my opponent, who later said he didn't prepare. But still, I think the arguments that I made in the in the, in the uh, thing are essentially the same arguments I will be making whenever I'm in discussion with other people about this. I think uh, this was the information we talked about was brought up uh, in church fan as well. So... Let's play this. One second. We're getting a free commercial. Two hour commute. Meet 12 minute meal. Help yourself. Yeah, so my name is Charles or Charles. for the Christ later on. And you go back saved your and watching your previous dangerous situation um what else i would like to mention um uh, because i already said what i want to say we can uh i can Let me stop make right sure here. things are turned up all the way daniel thank you so much for that opening statement and again whatever's not used we throw into the uh throw into the open discussion or the audience q a so Thank you so much for that, Daniel. And now we're going to hand it to Charles Jennings for your 12-minute uh, opening statement. If you need to share a screen, anything like that, just let me know. Yeah, and so let me know whenever I have a one-minute warning, okay? Okay. In large mode. Well, first off, I, I'm, no, I just want people to say I'm going to skip this part because I want to focus on the content of this. But there's a lot of things that I commend you for. Daniel Mira, and if somebody asks me what those reasons are, I'll bring that out. But I want to get into some of the concerns that whenever I was preparing for this debate and watching your previous debate, uh, the concern about a work salvationist, okay? I want to tell you this. My view, I don't use the term work salvationist. And you can go through my content and you can see that. But uh, the reason I say that is because if you believed in Christ at a point in time, then the issue is not your salvation the issue is your sanctification now what can happen is in the midst of your sanctification you can start getting things confused and misrepresenting the gospel mixing justification and sanctification is typically that all right so most people understand they've, they've seen my charts you probably are familiar with my charts uh i'm not going to go into explaining them for that reason my position is that we're eternally preserved even if we don't temporally persevere okay so going forward we can go into old testament imagery which is the backdrop for the book of hebrews but i'm basically going to contend that hebrews 10 refers to physical death 
and the loss of blessing inheritance. My basis for that is recognizing, number one, that Moses physically died. Uh, and what that meant was that he was not able to go into the promised land. Because now, the stuff about Hebrews 10 distributes to Hebrews 6, and I would say even the whole backdrop for all the warning passages. So keep that in mind. Because the promised land is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of inheritance and rewards and all that. Number two, the Exodus generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, as uh, far as anyone over 20 years old, were saved, but they physically died in the wilderness. They did not lose their salvation, and so they lost their inheritance. Numbers chapter 15, which is the key to understanding Hebrews 10, refers to physical death. Furthermore, uh, in 70 AD, when the Jewish wars come to their head and, and Rome comes down and destroys the, the temple in fire, one million Jews died in that. So the Lord had prophesied about this judgment. God is concerned about them. God is concerned about the Jewish Christians that could get caught up in that. So therefore, it's logical to believe for these reasons that physical death may be involved in these passages. Okay. Now, in Hebrews 3 and 4, you have the incident referred to as the Kadesh Barnea incident. This is where the spies did not bring a good report. They were already saved, but they didn't bring a good report. They brought bad news, in other words, except for Joshua and Caleb. What's interesting is that in the book of Numbers, this is covered in chapter 13 and 14. And then right after that, in Numbers 15, this is where you find the passage about sinning willfully or presumptuous sin, depending on how you translate it. Yes, willful sinning is talked about in the Bible. Yes, I interpret it in context. I do not avoid the issue, and we can go into exploring it. So this refers to sins deserving capital punishment or perhaps maybe even excommunication, depending how you understand cut off. So going back into the issue of 70 AD with one million deaths that occurred, we know this from Josephus. I know these words are not spelled right. We know this from Hegesippus, and we know this from Eusebius. Okay? Jesse Campin, who does not believe that a person cannot lose their salvation, he believes like you, Daniel, has made an excellent video on this. And I had hoped that you had seen this, but this is unlisted, so it's possible that you didn't. So I like a lot of the arguments that are in here. So I believe Moses is eternally secure. I believe the promised land is not a picture of heaven or else Moses wouldn't be there. I believe that the book of Hebrews is not warning that people would not make it to heaven. I agree that it's written to believers and it includes warning of divine discipline and loss of blessing inheritance. Now, going into our passage, Hebrews 10, 23, this passage where it's exhorting them not to forsake <coughs> the assembling of the saints. It's possible in 1025 that when it talks about the day drawing near, that that could be talking about the day of judgment, 70 AD, temporal judgment, it's in view. And then in the sinful willfully passage that you brought up, therefore the judgment would be the 70 AD and the fury of fire which consumes the adversaries would be 70 AD. Now this could have a near focus and a far focus, but we can deal with that if it comes up. But keep in mind that the temple was actually destroyed by fire. In 28, it refers to physical death underneath the law of Moses. In 29, it talks about a severe punishment because in contrast to the law of Moses, we have the new covenant. Now, the severe punishment does not mean physical death is not in view, but what it means is that now the issue is not just temporal punishment, but it's eternal rewards. See, Moses physically died, and he lost out in the ability in his temporal life to go into the promised land. But Moses had still received reward. Part of that was being at the transfiguration with Jesus. So we have to recognize the distinction between temporal rewards and, and uh, eternal rewards. So a severe punishment is a loss of eternal rewards to a certain extent. Now, if someone thinks that I'm reading the concept of reward into the passage, if you'll see in 1035, <coughs> it says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. Furthermore, in 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And if it helps you to understand the connection between the Old Testament and, and the backdrop for this book, just add the word land or inheritance next to promise so you can get a feel for that. 
in Numbers for, uh, 14 or 15, when it's talking about the sin that's unintentional, basically what it's saying is there remains a sacrifice for temporal forgiveness. In the next passage, when it's talking about sinning willfully, which is the basis for 1026, or sinning of the high hand, which is the sin that Moses committed, it's a distinction between non-capital crimes and capital crimes. See, if you committed a capital crime, even though it resulted in physical death, there was no temporal sacrifice that could be offered for temporal forgiveness. Also, Hebrews 6, as Daniel mentioned, in 6 it talks about the falling away, and it says it's impossible to remove them again to repentance. So this refers to the fact that if you commit a temporal capital crime, you have no sacrifice, no way to rectify the situation. Hebrews chapter uh, 11, the heroes of faith, shows that Moses was a believer. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, it talks about all of that. But you see in 26 that it talks about he considered the reproach of Christ, the Messiah, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to a reward. So the concept of reward is tied to Moses. Okay, now I'm going to go through this very fast. If you study Hebrews, the key is recognizing how Jesus Christ is the son through his obedience on the cross received an inheritance and so the idea is is that the believers as sons have the opportunity to be obedient and follow the example in sanctification so that they receive an inheritance and you can see tons of the passages that we can you know i'm i'm so satisfied with my introduction not with my tone because this is my first debate uh it's hot and my voice is stressed um I, uh, you could clearly see I, I was, I was, I was amped up about this, and and as David Preston says, I'm introverted. But whenever I'm in situations, I become more extroverted. So here I'm pushing myself in uncharted territory, at least for me at that time, and so you can hear that in my voice. Can go into where I'm making this distinction. I taught this in my church years ago. Here's one, uh, for God is not unjust to forget your work. And this is right after that uh, problem passage that, that people have difficulties with in Hebrews uh, 6. And then it right here, the patience and inherit the promises. So this is not talking about heaven. This is talking about the promises that are related to the Abrahamic covenant and the promises for receiving rewards. You keep going on and you got all these passages concerning this. Then dropping back in Hebrews 4, there's an exhortation. Therefore, let us fear. In other words, we should fear. That should be our response. A fear of missing out. FOMO. Uh, while a promise remains to enter in his rest, anyone may seem to come short of it. This is not a picture of salvation. This relates to rewards and reigning with Christ and all of that. The exhortation is to keep believing in God. I can deal with that if I need to. Um, here's quotes from Josephus that we can show that relates to 70 AD and how they understood that. Here's issues concerning Hecatsippus that we can go into. Here's a quote from Eusebius that we can go into if we need to. Okay? This is a key passage book that deals with the warning passages, and they're dealing with the severity of the physical punishment, quoting this. Arnold Frudenbaum is a Jewish Christian, and he argues from these sources in the same type of vein. And he's talking about how the book of Hebrews actually had a good positive result because the Jews at that time actually heeded the response and they they left basically the area so that whenever uh, this judgment came on, when Rome through Titus is coming in with the temple and stuff, their lives were spared when others were killed. And so the point being, and there's lots of passages I could go into about the Old Testament for salvation and all that, but the point being is that a hundred uh, or a million <coughs> Jews were killed. God cares about those million Jews. God cares about his promises. And he cares about the Jewish Christians that get caught up in that. Hebrews uh, 10 talks about this passage. Oh Lord, your hand is lifted up, yet they do not see it. They see your zeal for the people and are put to shame. Indeed, fire would devour your, your enemies. So right here, you have the idea of fire. It doesn't say hell. And when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to destroy all unbelievers by physical fire. Okay. Now, will they go to hell? Yes, they'll go to hell because they're unbelievers. Because 
but that's not necessarily saying that every time the word fire is used in the Bible that it refers to hell. We need to study that out contextually. In Deuteronomy 17, this is talking about the consequences of physical death. We could talk about, this is my, uh, my more detailed distinctions about uh, salvation in the Old Testament through various events, if we need to go into that. Here's some issues concerning sanctification that we can deal with. Also, the book of Hebrews in 12 talks about God being a perfect parent and how he disciplines his son. This is based on Deuteronomy 32, which deals with the issue of apostasy and all of that. Key for being a backdrop. So this Deuteronomy connection is very significant. Okay? So uh, I'll save that for later. Leviticus 10, when they offer profane fire, God destroyed them with fire. Physical fire, physical death. They were believers. Number 16, God kill, consumes 250. They were believers. Deuteronomy 17, talking about stoning. Isaiah 24, 6. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Doesn't say they've gone to hell. It's just referring to the temporal judgment that's brought in these passages. Talking about right here, Isaiah 25, waiting for his return and rejoicing in his salvation. This is the Messianic salvation, the fact that what he's going to bring in the Messianic millennial kingdom. Here's some quote slides from that one video minute by Jesse Campin and stuff. Here's some other passages that we can examine concerning Hebrews 2. Okay, that we can examine in that. So, anyway, I want you all to keep this in mind that there's a good basis for recognizing that physical death and temporal judgment is in view based on Moses' uh, death, based on the exogeneration death, based on the Kadesh Barnea incident, based on the 70 AD context. And for those reasons, I think there's warrant for this interpretation. God bless. Charles, thank you so much uh, for the. So, you know, it's interesting that Dan Chapa thinks that I'm going to argue for a loss of rewards. Loss of rewards is involved, but as you see, the, the argument for my Hebrews 10, which also relates to Hebrews 6, is about temporal judgment being physical death. And I think that's a metonymy. Because it doesn't mean that that uh, that it has to be physical death. In other words, it just refers to the extent that God has the, reserves the right to punish to the extent that He's mentioned in the covenants, and so physical death is in view in that as the extreme. This is like, for example, Corinthians. For some of you, weak, sick, and sleep. Sleep being the ultimate uh, example. The opening statement and the visuals that concludes. All right, so I'm gonna. I'm going to speed up to the part wherever I give. I'm going to continue my PowerPoint. Actually, I need to go with the drawing too. Again, to the audience, I see questions flying in. Uh, you know, the audience, uh, the chat, the live chat is, is already very lively. So, you know, I do appreciate uh, everybody being so passionate about this important topic. So, Daniel, thank you so much for your uh, eight-minute rebuttal. We're going to hand it over to Charles now from the Layman Seminary for your uh, eight-minute rebuttal. Whenever you're ready, let me know, and I'll give you a one-minute warning as well. I'm ready. Okay, Daniel, I'm going to use some language that the audience probably doesn't know. See, after 9-11, I started reaching out to Muslims because I felt like people weren't showing the love of God to them. And the Muslims, they they gave me different nicknames through different times. Tariq, Abdullah, Ta Talib, and then related to Surah Abbasa. So I want you to know that I have that background. And, and no, I don't know Arabic. I started once before. I commend you that you know the original uh, language of the Quran, as you mentioned before. Uh, I hope that you you will do the same type of study when it comes to the Bible. You mentioned Romans chapter 8. That's not an issue for me because I take that whole passage as experiential about sanctification. Okay, so what everybody was laughing or joking about is that my debate is going to be a death by a thousand charts. Because if you know anything from seeing my content, I use charts. But before I start drawing charts, I want to talk about the doctrine of imputation, three imputations. The sin of Adam was imputed to the world. And the sin of the world was imputed to Christ at the cross. And then when we believe in Christ, Christ's righteousness is imputed to our cross, uh, 
to our account. So what this means is that we have been set free. In fact, even unbelievers have been set free from the penalty of imputed sin. Okay. Imputed sin. I don't want to spell piss. Uh, imputed sin. All right. But because we have a sin nature, we still have the power. Charles, I'm just going to, I'm going to stop your sin. timer there real quick. Are, are you looking to share your screen with this chart? Oh, or you okay. Just... Sorry. Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. That's okay. I I'll got pause nervous. your timer here, brother. All right. So the power, this is not a good chart. This is scribble, You're but good. the power of individual sin. The problem with Daniel's arguments is he wants to appeal to God's justice, but he's actually going against the concept of double jeopardy that a person cannot be tried twice for the same crime. Because Jesus is our substitute, he died on the cross for us. We see this imagery in, in Romans chapter 6. And so Jesus died and paid the penalty for imputed sin. And that was the only thing that could send a person to hell. Even an unbelievers, uh, sit, the penalty has been dealt with. And the reason unbelievers go to hell is because they lack righteousness and eternal life, which is only given whenever they believe the gospel. The reason this is significant is because Daniel keeps appealing to personal sins that people could commit. And therefore, he interprets willful sin in that particular context. Now, he says that what I said was irrelevant because it was from the Old Testament. Uh, the, the problem with that is he's making an assumption that uh, everything that was in the Old Testament is now spiritualized in the New Testament. If you take that approach, then you run into a lot of different problems. Like, for example, do you believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back literally? Or is it just going to be figuratively? You know, when you compare the first coming, and we can deal with other variations of that. So I think that's an issue there. Uh, so I would ask on what basis he grounds the idea that it's not talking about physical death based on that. You know, what is his principles of hermeneutics that, that he's dealing with there? Um, other things that I want to talk about, you know, going to my chart and everything, if I draw it, imputed sin goes here, okay? Some people would put inherited sin here. I'm just going to put individual sin here. And then dwelling sin is removed here. So the basis, the reason that we are eternally secure is because imputed sin is already dealt with and therefore we're guaranteed to receive a glorified body here. The typical people use this penalty, power, and presence. So anytime you're bringing up temporal issues, it does not reverse what's happened in the eternal realm over here. And so that's the fundamental issue is that you recognize the concept of willful sin versus regular sinning, but you fail to recognize, at least it seems that way, to recognize these concerns about imputed sin, individual sin, and then dwelling sin. Furthermore, I think it's possible you have some baggage from Islam concerning sanctification. Perhaps you think that the Shahada uh, uh, is sort of comparable to that because it done away with your past sins, but your present sins are dealt with. Now you brought about the issue about bad behavior that you can't just lose rewards for that. Well, there are different types of sanctions that can be involved when we're talking about jurisprudence, fic, if, if, to use your terms, uh, previous terms and stuff like that. But we have to remember that judgment is not the only metaphor. In fact, according to Hebrews 12, going back to uh, Deuteronomy 32, the main metaphor is of God being a perfect parent. And so he judges perfectly. So it's not an issue of a loss of rewards is not possibility because of that. Because there's different sanctions or different consequences for different types of crimes. Our justice system is based off those distinctions between capital punishment. Now, the Catholics and other groups tried to make a distinction between mortal and venial because they took the same jumps that you have unintentionally, that you've spiritualized the passages instead of taking them literal, even though the original audience are Jewish Christians, and this is how they would understand it. You have committed cultural eisegesis because you're interpreting based on your simple reading from the 21st century and not taking into consideration everything that's evolved years. So I encourage you to study those passages in context. God bless. Okay, thank you so much, Charles, for that uh, eight minute rebuttal. Uh, actually a little bit of time there that we can toss into the discussion. And the, uh, the uh,
lose it. You can never, regardless of the accident you have or anything. Okay, so I'm just recording the times that I use the chart and my PowerPoints and stuff. But from the moment you go hit the tree, you come to is the fraud. Okay, so what you're Jesus saying is, is shame. what yeah. you're saying is the condition for eternal assurance is that you don't commit fraud. Yes, that's what you're saying. Yes. Okay, but did Jesus die for fraud? Did it die for the fraud? Jesus died for your sin. Jesus died for all sin. So how yeah. could? Jesus's penalty, which is the basis for the insurance, be the basis for losing the insurance. I, I'm not following you, man. That's double jeopardy. Okay, let me draw. If you need a sh uh, screen share, let me know. Okay, you're All good. All right, so, so this is how I'm understanding things, okay? You're talking about insurance, right? And, and you're saying insurance is eternal life. Okay, and that this is offered to you. But if you commit fraud over here, yeah. you're saying that this insurance is revoked. Is that correct? Revoked. Am I understanding you right? Exactly. So insurance is eternal, but you commit the commit the fraud. This eternity, you walk out of the eternity. Okay. Let me let me let me ask you further questions concerning this analogy. So this right. insurance and this view, if we want to use the word insurance. If we're using scripture, Jesus paid the penalty. So in other words, what covers the insurance? Jesus paid the policy and deals with all uh, possible factors that come up. All factors, including fraud. So are you saying that whenever no, he gave the insurance policy, that no, there Jesus. was a conditional statement that if you continue right. in sin, Jesus. you, no, you give up your salvation? Okay, so Jesus cannot pay for the fraud for the simple fact that the free will still exists. So therefore, he okay, can so you think you think that salvation is by free will, right? You have to go and repent, and I God forgive you. Yes. Okay. Well, I don't want to get into repent right now, but this is what I want to say: salvation is not based on free will. It's based on believing in Jesus Christ as the right object. So that you if you use your if you use your free will here. It doesn't reverse that Christ has put you in himself in an eternal realm that cannot be reversed. Yes. Nothing done in time can reverse what's done in eternity. So free will is not the basis of salvation. Therefore, it cannot be the basis of giving up salvation. Okay. Uh, <laughs> very bad logic. Um, so oh, why is you, it bad logic? I believe you. I believe that. You know what? I, Daniel, I believe that you can become a Muslim again. I believe uh, if, that you can apostatize, but you know what? You're still going to heaven because you believe the gospel at one point in time. John 3, 16, you never perish. You've passed from death to life. That's already occurred. I'm going to right. see you in heaven. I just want you to have some rewards. I want you to have influence. I want you to, to have a greater impact on the Islamic community for, for Christ. All right. So so many topics. You, you, you mentioned three topics at the time at least. So free will. You have to use a free will to repent and come to Jesus. And then Jesus cannot pay for the fraud. Thank you for the chart, by the way. Um, uh -huh. He can use the fraud. Uh, he cannot pay for the fraud because you have a free will. You should be able to use the free will. Okay. And, let me okay. let me clarify something. So think of it like this. You use your free will and you get in a rocket ship that takes you to a space station that's not on this temporal realm. It's in space. Okay. Okay. And, and, you're, and, and you are viewed as a citizen of space, regardless if you come back and voyage on Earth, okay? So this is my point. When you use your free will, I'm going to concede that, to enter into this new realm, but the eternal realm is not reverse. Your eternal status, your eternal citizenship is not reverse just because you go in your temporal realm and live like an earthling, even though you are a cosmonaut. Well, this is your logic, but this is not what Bible says. It says you will not. It is. Let me tell you why. In Ephesians chapter one, it says we're seated in Christ in the heavenlies, so the spiritual places. Also, Philippians makes the argument that we're citizens of heaven, and the significance of that in the context of the book of Philippians, the the Philippi had dual citizenship. It was both other Roman province and it was itself had their own citizenship. So Paul is appealing on that metaphor. Therefore, my metaphor is. A biblical even though spaceships didn't exist at that time 
No, the Bible doesn't teach that, my friend. Simply, I, I talk about what, it. What does it not teach? Well, if you don't have sacrifice in your account, you go to hell. The sacrifice, say that again? If you don't have sacrifice in your account, you will go to hell. Okay, sacrifice in your account. This is the thing that happens. At the moment of salvation, you are given Christ's eternal life. You are given Christ's eternal righteousness, and that can never be revoked. The only way you could lose your salvation is if Christ lost his righteousness. The basis for your eternal security is not your righteousness. It's not your works. It's Christ's righteousness. It's Christ's tell, eternal life. And you tell, know about the attributes of God because you're a Muslim. We have what is called communicable attributes that can be spread like COVID. And eternal life is an example of a communicable attribute that God shares with his creation. Just as God uh, sustains his physical creation, he sustains his spiritual creation. We're united in him in spirit. We're fused together with him, and that cannot be reversed. Well, tell Paul. Why are you telling me? Okay, you're Paul. saying tell Paul, but if you're going to make that argument, then why are you trying to debate? If all we got to do is read Paul, then why are you attempting to debate? Do well, I'm you telling believe you. it? I'm because telling you, you what Paul says. Well, I'm telling your you interpretation says, of Paul, it's, your, it interpre not, okay, your interpretation right, of Paul speak. is not right. inspired. You are Donnie, not the Holy Spirit. Donnie, he doesn't let me speak. He doesn't let me speak. He doesn't let me speak. Go ahead, Daniel. Let's do uh, some uninterrupted responses. So, Daniel, take as much time as you need, and then we'll let Charles respond. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, my, my response is not long. I just want to be able to respond quickly when he mentions something. He can respond, but the thing is, is that if you're going to bring up assertion after assertion, after you've already said you haven't prepared in the debate, if I remember right, I think he's already said that, then I'm going to counter every one of those assertions at that time. And I'm going to trust the moderator to rein me in, you know. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to hold back, you know, of course I've gotten better at my tact and, and my delivery and things and my composure. Um, for the most part, I let the person escalate. Um, but this was my first debate. So, you know, there's, there's growth that's occurring here. Um, the reason I say why Paul talk to Paul while we debate, because, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm reason with you, but you just go against what Paul said. What else I can do? Okay. I'm so saying you're, if you you're don't have, I'm saying if you don't have, if you don't have sacrifice in your account, then you will go to hell. That's what the Bible says. It's not only Paul. It's not only Paul. It's James. It's What's so shocking is that his view of salvation is so similar to the Church of Christ. Basically, the idea is that Jesus died. For, for people, but if you're not water baptized, then that blood is not applied to you. And so he basically says that you got to have Christ's sacrifice in your account. But if you decide to cash out your account or give the money back, you know, then you no longer have salvation. Or if you commit fraud in his illustration, that does away with that. But as I was saying before, if Christ paid the penalty for imputed sin, then he's already dealt with the basis for paying for the policy. And so uh, fraud cannot reverse that. The sanity, uh, every, everything, and you go to the Old Testament is the same way. I, okay, I want to show you, uh, no, no, you, you tell me one inconsistency in, in, in an hour, 20 minutes. Tell me in what part I've been inconsistent. You've been inconsistent all the time. Well, the issue is, is that you you say Jesus Christ died for sin, but then you're then you're saying that sin can keep you from going to heaven. Do you believe do you that Jesus died for the pen Do you believe that Jesus died for the penalty of all sin once for all, or or do you believe that you got to continue to make sacrifices after being saved, and your sacrifice is of repentance or whatever action you want to add to the work of Christ at the cross? Charles, with all due respect, I don't think your your mind is organized. You just uh, you just make up some 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 invalid logic. Um, you, I don't know how to respond to you. No. Okay. Well, well where Jesus, does it say in, where, where does it say in scripture that if the sacrifice is not in your account, uh, you're not saved? Well, if I show you, what would you do? I think I probably would believe. It depends okay. on if I understood it contextually. You know what? I would become a Muslim if I get convinced of that truth. That's how open I am to the truth. This is how logical you are. Why would you want to be a Muslim? 
I don't want to be a Muslim, but I want to be truth. And you know what? Truth knocks the brains out of falsehood. Okay. You are telling me if I show you that context in the Bible, you become convert to Muslim. Why? If if you no, that's not what I said. I'm saying that I am so open to the possibility of me being wrong and being corrected by truth that I have no allegiance. If you convince me that Christianity is not true or someone else does, and, and I, I am responsible by God to follow the truth and walk okay. in the light that I have. And if okay. not, then I will be judged more. That's all I'm saying. All right, well, Charles, well, here's what I'm saying. Now, it, it's okay to have, um, uh, you know, different in, 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 in theology, but um, it, there's some, some extent and you still be saved and go to heaven. There are a lot of people believe that once you save, always safe. They're gonna to go to heaven as much as I can, I go. Uh, no problem. But you mentioned some very dangerous doctrine in here that Jesus died for a sin of unbelievers. You can no unbeliever. They have to repent and come to Jesus and take okay, advantage. Okay, so of now you're making that claim. Sin. What do you, you mean did. by repent? What do you, you mean did. by repent? I don't know. Let's go. Um, okay. Um, you, you don't know the repentance. Why you have problem with repentance? I have four views of repent that I can accept, See, but none of just, them, none of them like, are the idea that you turn from individual sins to be saved. So I want exactly, you to base this that is exactly what you miss. This is okay. I, I'll be glad to. I'll be glad to. This is exactly what your um, the, the issue is. Okay. So l l for example, you go to act uh, in a comment. You show me. I show to to show you. I'm playing this out because. I want you all to see how this unfolds. Some of you have seen this before, but I mean, the lessons in this video are just so rich and so deep because now the issue of repentance comes up and he's made it a condition for salvation or maintaining salvation, you know, and he's not being clear about his view of repentance. And um, it, the, you'll see that he doesn't understand basically what sin truly is, what uh, what Christ did at the cross. You know, not saying he's not saved. Uh, maybe he had a glimmer of that at the very beginning, and he believed that. But the issue is, is that he's just so unclear in these areas. Where God says to repent, just simply go uh, type in repent in a Google search. It will come up. Uh, Act uh, seventeen thirty. It says, and the times of this ignorance God wink, uh, winked at, but now command all men everywhere to repent. But right? does it define repent? Does oh, it yeah. say anything about there that they got to stop doing individual sins? Is that mentioned, or is it repent. talking about certain content? What is the content? You say change your mind. Well, change your mind about what? What is the content that one must repent about to be sin. saved? Hello? About sin. Okay, about let me sin. hear the let me hear that in the passage. Read to me where it's talking about sin. Okay. Um, so the, what do you want me to read the same thing? Okay, I'll read is the, it does the passage mention individual sins that a person has to repent from to be saved, yes or no? It's, the, what you're saying to me is like the Muslim saying, show us where Jesus is, I'm God, worship me. So for you to believe. What, what, what I have no you? problem. You can give me yeah. implicit arguments, okay. but you're making a clear statement that repentance is what? associated for salvation right. with turning from individual sins. Okay, I'll so show where's you. it yeah. at? Look, 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 17, look at Luke 17, 3. It says, take heed to yourself. If thy brother uh, trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent for okay, I apologize. I, I, yeah, I, that's experiential. Uh, yeah, that's that's a different uh, context. I'll show it to you. Repent. All of the Bible is turn away from sin. All all of the Bible. That's your so, assertion, but you haven't no, established where it no, says no, you is, get saved by turning away from your sin. Of course, that's what I said. Just watch a beautiful sermon of Dr. Ken Hoven, and that's what the reason I was. Well, if you had prepared, you would have had a beautiful sermon. But I don't. I respect Johnny's uh, uh, Johnny's uh, channel. Uh, he's the boss in here. As simple as it. No, okay. no. What I mean is that you okay. should have studied Ken Hovind and known his argument enough so that you would have been able to articulate it, even if you're called on the spot. No, no. Why are you assuming I didn't? I'm just saying the way that Dr. Hovind explained it is, is just because you didn't tell me you prepared. If you have more confidence in Dr. Hovind, that's fine, and you lack confidence. If you want to admit that, I lack yeah. confidence. In certain areas, it, but if it, you it, can't it, tell me, if you can't tell me your view of repentance, 
from your own mouth. Either you don't know it or you haven't worked enough on articulating okay. it. Okay, you asked me two things. Well, why don't we do this, guys? I want to get this back on track. Very simple question. We can even allow you both to to answer this, okay? I'm trying um, to say a topic. Daniel, let, 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 let's do this. I'll, I'll ask the question, then you both can take your time to answer it, and we'll go from there. Daniel, what is your view or definition of repentance in the context of salvation? And then we'll do the same to Charles, and I think this might help us. Okay, so I respond. Okay, there is only, um, the, the, the word repentance has two contexts in the Bible. One, God repented in the book of Genesis. It doesn't mean God repent from his sin. It means turn around from, because we had the free will to obey him. We didn't, to God repent. And then, um, so that's context. And another context, every single time goes to salvation. Every single time. You show me a repentance that doesn't go to salvation. Every time. You've made the condition. You've made the condition for a person remaining saved, saved, or being saved, repentant. So the burden of proof is on you as it relates to this debate to uh, show me in uh, passages where yeah. where individual sins are involved when a person is getting saved. When you um, so you want me to show you the verse that. Uh, yeah. But, uh, there is there is no there is no verse that says um, every single sin turn turn away from every single sin doesn't work. You hear that, guys? He he, and and I'm not saying there isn't a verse, but he's basically just admitted that there's no verse from his understanding that there's no passage that says that you have to turn away from every single sin to be saved. Okay. Well, I'm not even saying every single sin. I'm saying uh, certain sins. You know, Let, let's go into that work that way when you are okay repent, well give me one sin let's do with one sin but if okay. i show it find to you, one passage that shows one sin but if i if i show it to you you say it's different context well I then what, what do you expect you're saying it's a different context. No, i don't expect anything else i know i know what you do i don't expect right anything right else. yeah okay so what's the point I'll you would have you. known this and you probably could have backed out of the debate and saved people a lot of time if you had prepared what is what is your problem with my? <laughs> I'm ready to. Do, uh, I'm responding to you because I'm you prepared. seem so sh you seem so I'm shocked that I'm trying to run everything through a chart. You talk about logic analysis and everything, but I've given you a grid that you can run things through, filter, and 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 so far you have not either refuted the grid or argued that the grid doesn't hold water concerning particular passages. I did. I did, man. You just say it doesn't. There is no. I, I just uh, keep it very simple. There is one context, except that book of Genesis. One context in repent in the whole Bible. It's it's uh, you repent from your sin, not unbelief. That's garbage. You believe you repent from is your sin. Is unbelief a sin? Huh? Is unbelief, unbelief a sin? Unbelief, it's a sin. Yeah. Okay, so then it's not garbage. No, the, the way that you translate it, the reason they don't want to, the reason OSAS people, I know you're not the normal OSAS people. Let's say Donnie is a normal OSAS person. So Donnie has to say um, that repentance, when it says, when Jesus says repent, the kingdom of, of God at hand, OSAS people, they say, they repent from unbelief. It's nonsense. No, that pass, that's not my view. That passage is experiential. That's referring to Jesus' offer of the Messianic Millennial Kingdom to them. It's not even referring to salvation. Okay. So when Jesus said, go sin no more, he meant uh, go uh, disbelief no more? What, which passage are you talking about? Go sin no more. Very famous one. It's uh, to the prostitute, the, the woman. Right, I mean, right. And which yeah. I'm going to bring it up because it is part of the study. As you know, it's not in all manuscripts. Now, See, go well, and sin no more. Go uh, and sin no more can refer to the uh, the issue of of divine discipline because the standard is always go and sin no more in that issue. Uh, First John said, "I write these things that you may not sin, but if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father." So yes, Jesus Christ said, "Go and sin no more." If He said, "Go and sin some more or a little bit more," then He would be compromising His righteousness and He wouldn't qualify as sinless uh, sacrifice. But actually, your belief, what it's doing, is it's saying a little bit of sin is enough. 
but it's only these willful sins that you have in mind that cause you to give up your salvation, causes you to go across the point of no return. And frankly, that's closer to the distinction of mortal and venial sins in the Catholic faith, ironically, even though you charged me with being Catholic or like Catholic. I didn't say you look Catholic. I said your argument you're using it remind me of Catholics. Uh, so, yeah, Shay. for example, huh? What do you say? Right back at you, in other words. In other words, your argument is more Catholic than my argument. Not at all. Not at okay. all. Okay. No. Um, like, for example, uh, I was talking to this Catholic. I said, you know, um, what all what all these things you do for salvation is very simple. You know, the thief on the cross, he just got saved instantly when he repent, uh, when he basically changed his attitude and God forgive him. How do you know all? the thief on the cross wasn't already saved? He was not saved because he was saved. How do you know? Okay, he's Bible a sinner, so, so sinners can't be saved? There is, I, don't, I don't believe there is a single Christian in the whole world believe that that, that thief was saved. Actually, it's possible that he was saved. Okay, How did man. he know about the kingdom? Yeah, man, also, man. he might have been a zealot, which means he was fighting for Israel. So he, he might have been fighting for the Messiah in the wrong way, but he believed in the Messiah. Let me jump in, gentlemen. Again, such a great discussion. We've got a, a, a really awesome chat tonight. So 80 plus people still, tons of questions coming in. I'm looking at my moderator notes and I see, uh, you know, Hebrews 10, Romans 8, John 15. And you guys have done a fantastic job engaging all of those uh, texts down and get in for a bit of closing statement. Engaged all the texts. Um, I guess Galatians 5, back and forth, just 5, it talks about, you know, can you, can you fall from the grace? And you say to you that nothing, that he tries to be covered by the law. He done that. He said, I'm going to fall from it's still sacred. We can go to John 8. Hey, salvation has always been by grace. People don't realize this, though. The sanctification has always been by grace. And God has used, his, used various codes or covenants as the means of sanctification throughout time. In the church age, we could call this the grace code, the church code, the Christ code. And in John, it says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We know that based on that principle that he's not talking about salvation because people have been able to be saved from the beginning. So we have this precedent that uh, from there as, as Galatians for this idea that the distinction is between law and grace. So grace is not referring to salvation. It's referring to the principle or standard by which we operate. It's the rule of life. It's the code in operation. And in context, what it's talking about is people not realizing that the Mosaic code is no longer the means of sanctification. And so Paul argues from the Abrahamic covenant that the principle of faith is sanctification by grace has always been the standard. So they need to stop trying to teach people they got to be sanctified uh, through uh, circumcision and mosaic law keeping and all of that. So that's my response to that. I actually, I agree. I agree with this. That's one of the 85 passages that people use that you say you can lose your salvation off the table. So bring on the other 84. Not much of this. Uh, a Christian can backslide, a Christian okay, can apostatize, and they're still eternally secure. So what happens if someone uh, perpetually backslides? They're eternally secure. Well, not according to Second Peter. Uh, Go ahead. Chapter. Okay. For if we, after we have escaped um, the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entang entangled therein and overcome. The letter and is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of the righteousness than after they have known it. To turn from the, um, the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the truth, to the to the true proverb. Uh, the dog is turned to his vomits and things like that. And then so, and the okay. so that was, uh, huh? So. I, I understand your argument there. You think that that's referring to someone losing their salvation. Well, if you study the passage, you have two issues going on. One, you have the first part dealing with the false prophets. And then you have those that have fallen into the trap of the first prophets. Now, the statement about it, uh, it's worse than what they're beginning, that's referring to their sanctification and not their salvation. And so just like a person who gets caught up in sin after being saved, they're going to have regrets and shame concerning that. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're not saved. 
Or loss of salvation. Okay. Then, um, so for sanctification, this, this kind of language that I mean used in here, for the better for them, um, hold on. Okay, so the, um, hold on, man. Where was It'd be it? better not referring to salvation, it's referring yeah, I to lost, sanctification. I lost, I lost my screen, yeah. Sanctification. Why do you always talk about sanctification? The, well, there's three aspects of sanctification. I'm glad you brought it up. Positional, experiential, and ultimate. So which one are you talking about? Uh, first of all, I have to agree with what you're saying. I'm saying this is about salvation. Okay, well, every, there's every three time, aspects of salvation. Time, Positional, time, experience, and ultimate. Which one are you okay. talking about? Well, every time, every time you don't like it, you go to sanctification. No, I'm, I'm showing it. That's not the issue. San that's not the issue, sir. Sanctification in the Bible is not, is not, uh, is, is not the main thing. So it, your uh, assertion is about my motives, that if I don't like something, exactly, then that's, that's why I go to sanctification. You know what? That's possible. But it's also possible that you like certain passages that are fire and brimstone, being Never that done. you came out of Islam. No. And you're used to all of that. That's a wide imagination. It's like atheist type. Oh well, why is it a wild imagination? Do you want to because talk about the? Do you want to talk about the purification of the nafs and how they view sanctification? Do you want to talk about the Kiyom and Deem? Do you want to talk about the 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 uh, Sarat al Mustaqim and how all these factors affect how you view Christianity? Because you have read your culture into these passages. What if not? Well, then 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 there's some other basis for why you're missing the target. No, I, I guarantee you, you're making a huge mistake. It's not true. Okay, that's fine. I, I'm able to make mistakes, and, but you know what? Right, I'm still but, eternally but, secure. But the stuff, the stuff, the stuff that you just uh, tied, um, that you name it about Islam, um, you you don't you don't know them, my friend. You just uh, I don't know don't, it. Well, what no, madhab were you of? Huh? What madhab were you? I don't even know what you're saying. You don't know what the word madhab means? The school no. of thought that you follow? Well, who, oh. uh, in other words, you're a man. Ma what school of thought? Hanafi, Hanbali, Sh Sh Shafi, you know, Sunni, Shia, uh, all those. You know what I'm talking about. Well, it's, it's mashab, not not the one that you probably. Well, probably yeah, I'm country and Texan. I can't say the no. words right. No, no, no. No, I'm just saying why I didn't understand. Um, doesn't matter. Islam, you know, uh, it uh, is a produce of a psychopathic. Psycho man, child molester, uh, piece of garbage man, uh, wrote Quran, and uh, prophet of Satan. So it doesn't really matter what language you read it. Right, but those passages in, in the Quran mm -hmm. deal with that. All right, so let me ask you a question. If I say Rabbi Zidni Ilma, what did I just say? What, say again? Rabbi Zidni Ilma, what am I saying? Uh, I just understand the first uh, word that you say, it's my God. Right. Zidni. What's Zidni? I don't know. I don't okay. know. Um, Maybe I'm saying it wrong. Oh, Lord, our advances in knowledge. Okay. Okay, that's what you're trying to say. Okay. Um, right. So what, what is your point? Well, my point is, is that, I, I forgive me, but if someone says they know the original languages, I'm going to test them, you know? So yes, okay. that was a test. And it's possible you misunderstood me, uh, but it's also possible that you don't know the languages as much as you assert. Gentlemen, gentlemen, fantastic discussion. Time has flown by, very lively, very engaging. And I gotta say, congratulations. We managed to engage all kinds of debate statements. This is your opportunity now at this point. Minutes from the both of you. Daniel, you're- And uh, you know, uh, and then we're going to get into some of these. I'll include his closing statement um, just so you see what, you know, what he concluded. And I'll include mine as well. Audience questions. So, Daniel, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, I mean, as I said, I like uh, the different um, format of debate, but, you know, we cannot get it most of the time. Uh, I like to ask questions and then, uh, you know, just answer me and I follow up question until proof that you're inconsistent. Um, my closing statements, uh, I would say that uh, if you have some uh, sacrifice in your account, you go to heaven. If you don't have it, you go to hell. And this is, this is exactly the case. Um, if you want to be saved, you repent, 
Sometimes you don't understand, then you repent. You just, uh, you know, glory of God uh, bring you to repentance. This is what happens to me. I never remember. I said, God, I repent for everything. No, I just changed the attitude. And, uh, you know, uh, God saved me. So when you preach it, you have to say um, that you need to repent. And then you have to trust Jesus Christ and God give you a new heart and it will take you to heaven. And once you're saved, you don't have to be worried about uh, losing the salvation. Uh, you, you are going, you are going to heaven. But uh, there are uh, there are uh, circumstances that you might lose it. That's the whole point here. And that's my um, like for example when you when you talk to Muslims because they always they tell me you guys are Christian uh, you you Christian are, are are stupid. They you believe after you are saved doesn't matter what you do you go to heaven. And uh, this is a wrong teaching. And every time I tell them, I show them the book, we study together. They they change their hearts. This is has a good fruit. This teaching from the Bible that if you willfully sin, there shall remain no sacrifice in your account. Is fruitful, is beautiful. It works. That's what I preach it. Now, if you think um, you don't have to, then uh, just gamble with your life. See what happens. Um, Thank you so much, Charles and Donnie. My privilege, uh, Daniel Mira, thank you for that five minute uh, concluding statement. Uh, Charles, we're gonna hand it to you now. You've got uh, five minutes, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, um, Daniel had the burden of proof and I'm just learning that language. Uh, and therefore that means that he needed to uh, prove that you could lose or forfeit your salvation. He's claiming to be consistent and that implies that he's charging me with inconsistency. But I challenge him or anybody to say that I'm inconsistent within my position. In fact, people will say that don't agree with me that I'm consistent. Another thing is, is that I bring up again constantly that individual sins do not send people to hell. Jesus died for the penalty of imputed sin because the sin of Adam was imputed to the world. The sins of the world were imputed upon the cross, the cross to Christ, and then we believe in him for righteousness. So individual sins are not the issue. Uh, the issue about individual sins, maybe it's confusing to him or maybe he likes it when appealing to Muslims because it fits within their system, okay? Uh, concerning the issue of repent, he says you gotta use the word repent. Well, if you use the word repent without defining what it is, it's as beneficial as speaking in tongues. Today I've used Arabic uh, terms that are, that are known to him, even though my accent was wrong in a lot of areas and everything. But my point is they're not beneficial to the other people that don't know it. In the same way, that's how it is with the word repent, unless you qualify it. And he hasn't established that repentance from individual sins is not the basis for salvation, the entrance into salvation. Also, the reason that he holds to his view of salvation may be as an Islamic polemic. It's been convenient to him. Earlier, he said it was convenient to me to put everything in the experiential category. And you know what? I can accept that. That's possible that I could be deceived into believing that. But it's also convenient that he's adopted this approach so that he could be hard and stern against Western culture, sin and all that stuff, but yet give an opportunity to defend Christ. The thing is, is that I have established the chart. He has not refuted the chart, nor has he referred to the possibility that those uh, senses that running those words through can refer to that. And so hopefully what, what I want people to be left with this debate is that look at the chart, examine the chart, run it through scripture and base your decisions and the statements on scripture and not just on cliches. God bless. Charles. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this or addressed it, but I didn't, I don't think in my closing, I uh, tied in my original argument for Hebrews about temporal death being the primary view, maybe even 70 AD, you know, I can't remember. I'm not going to go into the question and answer section. I'm getting tired. I'm going to land this plane. So yeah, let me stop sharing. So anyway, if you've been blessed by this video, subscribe. Uh, if you haven't already hit the bell, get notifications so that you don't miss out on any content or when we go live streaming. Um, or things like that. Um, share it with others if you think it will benefit others. And uh, keep this ministry in prayer. Most of all, 
And if you feel that God has blessed you through this ministry and you would like to donate or give, um, there's a link for PayPal underneath the most videos or underneath the about section. God bless.